So this is part two. So if you missed part one, you can go and find it somewhere in the space of YouTube. But this is part two of the power of words. It's, to me, such a critical aspect of the human experience to understand how our language is so integral to our emotional, relational, spiritual health. In fact, I've always, as far as I can remember, been a student of language. And one of the great uh, joys I've had recently is I, I've actually launched this master class called The Art of Communication, where we're looking at the art and science of communication, the art and science of words. But today I want to talk to you not about the art and sang- science of communication, but really the spirit of communication. That there, there's something profoundly deep about what happens when human beings actually communicate with each other. Something extraordinary, almost magical, but I, I don't want to diminish this by, by my choice of words. But there is almost like a magic inside of words that, that someone can speak to you and transmit a truth that could change your life. Someone's words could actually unlock a fear or paralysis in your soul. Someone could speak to you and suddenly you, you see things with such clarity, a, a new vision for your life emerges. I mean, you think about what we transmit to each other simply through the power of our words. Inside of a word, there is locked within it so much potential for good or destruction. And, and yet we treat words as if they're just... A, an evolutionary anomaly that we've learned how to communicate better than other species. But to think that's all there is is to diminish the power, the spiritual nature of language. Something happens when we talk to each other. Something changes within us when we speak into each other's lives. And so I was trying to go back to the first time I ever understood the power of words. I mean, I was young. I was probably still in elementary school. I said something that I probably should not have said in front of people I should not have said in front of. And so my mom and stepdad said, Erwin, go get a bar of soap. (laughs) And so I went and got this bar of ivory soap. And it's about the harshest soap in the world. And, And then they had me carve my name into the soap. And then my stepdad said, if I ever hear you use language like that again, You're going to eat that bar of soap. And I can tell you from experience, soap does not taste good. And so I realized that that they were telling me to watch my words. In fact, that's what they said. Watch your language. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. And it does strike me that the most profound memory I have around words is a negative one. I said something I shouldn't have said or said something I should have said, but in the way I shouldn't have said it. And ironically, I've grown up never really using profanity at all because I decided profanity was just a low level of intelligence. I wanted to find a far more creative way to cuss you out. (laughs) And and so I'm really creative and masterful. I say everything you say. I just say it with so much more panache. I say it with so much more class and style and elegance. And, and so you don't even know what I've said to you until you go home. <laughs> he goes, oh, I think I can summarize that in two words. <laughs> but why is it that my first interaction with the power of words was about watching my words, not saying the things I shouldn't say? Where was the German chocolate cake when I said something that should have been said? See, where was the celebration? Where was the cheesecake with blueberry toppings saying, I love the way you encourage your sister. I, I like the way you didn't say to your brother what you wanted to say. I, I, well, where, where, where were the words? I, I just really like the way you affirmed that person. See, we rarely grow up with someone telling us, I love the way you've used your words to make the world better. We're normally punished or warned because our words are destructive or inadequate or inappropriate. And yet there is something transcendent about words that we often overlook. And I want to look at the words of Jesus to us. Because you know that phrase that says that there are things we do in this life that are written in eternity? 
See, I actually think they are, they are not written in eternity. I think they are spoken in eternity. In Matthew 16, beginning of verse 19, Jesus says this. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he goes on to say a very similar thing in Matthew 18, but this is not Matthew saying twice what Jesus said once. This is Matthew recording that Jesus said this more than once, so you need to pay attention. In Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20, Jesus says this, Truly I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So that's a theme that we should pay attention to. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, I am there with them. Now when Jesus is actually laying out this picture, he's trying to help them understand their relationship between time and eternity between the now and the infinite, and help them understand that there is a dynamic power available to them that they may be underestimating. Because there is power in what you say. And what you say has power. And if you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to understand what Jesus is saying to you about what you've been entrusted with. He says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So here's my disclaimer. I don't want to pretend that I understand what this passage means completely. I do not. I think I understand it better now than I did 20 years ago, but I know I do not understand it fully. Because there are a lot of principles, a lot of truths that Jesus gives us that can only be understood as you live them out. And I have not yet even begun to touch the territory of what these words mean. And in fact, there have been times I've underestimated their power, and then I've been pressed in a moment, and I pushed against them, and I realized there's more power here than I expected, or more than I suspected. And a part of the problem is that sometimes we use language, and it diminishes the power of the words that Jesus uses. One of the reasons I love L.A. is that L.A. is such a spiritual city. We are. We are a very deeply spiritual city. We're just spiritual like a compass without a due north. <laughs> and so we have a language that's very spiritual, and it's almost always almost right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's almost right. And, and so when you use that language, especially for people like my wife, Kim, it drives you crazy. So why do you use that language? That's the language that other people use. I know, because it's really close to being right. Like, in, in L.A., we, we can't say God, but we can't say the universe. So if you believe in God, you're not very thoughtful or intelligent, but if you believe in the universe, you're really, really edgy. <laughs> right? And so it's okay to believe in the universe, but not to believe in the God who created the universe, but it's okay. It's so close. It's just, you're, you're so close. You're almost there. And, and I think, and you're closer than the person who's completely unaware that there's something bigger than us out there. So if you're here and you believe in the universe, you're closer to believing in God than the person who thinks that they're everything. Oh, like another word, like we can't say spirit, like Holy Spirit, but we can say energy. <laughs> All right? So we don't believe in spirit, but we do believe in energy. So as long as like, you know, I'm feeling the energy in the room, that's okay. Like, oh, wow, wow, you're, you really got it. You're like, you're in touch with the energy, like, you know. And they say, no, no, that's, that's God's presence. That's, that, that, that's the spirit of God. That's weird. That's weird. No, no, it's energy. It's, it's just so close. It's just so close, right? And it's because the Holy Spirit energizes in fact, even in the Bible, the word is dunamis, which is dynamite. It's like the Spirit of God explodes within you. But energy. Like, and there's, and there's another phrase, like manifesting. Right? That's a big L.A. word, manifesting. Right? And it's so close. It's like, when I, 
if you're not familiar with manifesting, you're not on Instagram, all right? Because like, <laughs> Instagram is all about manifesting. It's like, I, I get so many people manifesting on Instagram. There are days I'm like, maybe, maybe I should, should try. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know it's, no one's here, no one's paying attention, you know, and, and, because you ever just feel like, I just feel like I, I'm, I need to manifest something. It, it, it's like you're about to give birth to something, and it feels right. And it's, you know why it feels right? Because it's almost right. <laughs> it, it, because it, it's not that you're manifesting something, it's that you're actually materializing something. And, and here's the dilemma. See, when you manifest without God, you're speaking into the air. But when you're actually speaking in agreement with God, you're materializing the future into existence. And, and, and the reason I bring this up is because I, I think a lot of us who actually are people of faith, and we're trying to live our lives according to the truths in the scriptures, we're actually living beneath our capacity. And that person who actually believes in manifesting is closer to the reality that the person who thinks the Bible is just there to memorize information and truth. Because God has designed you to create in relationship to him. And the reason people who haven't connected to God are exploring and, and experiencing this whole idea of manifesting is because there is power in our words. And whether you realize it or not, you are creating as you communicate. You're creating as you're communicating. It's not that you're speaking things into existence. It's that you're speaking them into conviction, into agreement. Because you are creating with God because you're speaking what God is speaking. So Jesus says, I, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And with all the understanding that there's so much more, this is the very least. What you need to know is you have been given authority. You have been given keys to the kingdom. Before we even get to the kingdom, just the fact that God has given you keys. I mean, I, I have two kids that came out of Kim's womb that we raised, and it was hard for me to give them keys to the car. <laughs> and Jesus is giving us keys to his kingdom. And most of us... Most of us have no idea what that means. Well, yeah, this is awesome. But what's the point of having keys if you do not know what the keys unlock? Because you don't know what's behind door number one. Because it's the kingdom and that makes you nervous. You're not sure what that means. But the very least you need to realize that Jesus says if you're in relationship with him, he has given you authority. And I want you to walk out of this place today knowing how to activate that authority in your life. But it begins by knowing you have it. And I remember when Mariah was like 10 years old, she was in the top 1% of height. I know, it's hard to believe. She achieved her full height by fourth grade. And that's as tall as she is now. But up to fourth grade, Mariah was a giant. Now, Aaron was always in the, the lower percentile, so they were three years apart, so she was basically like taller than her three-year-old older brother. And so she played basketball, and she was the center. Mariah was the center on the girls' basketball team, and her only fear, she would come to me, she goes, Daddy, I don't want to hurt the other children. Because she was so much taller than all of them, she could just move them out of the way. She was Shaq at the age of eight. And so I coached her girls' basketball team because I coached all of Aaron's sports, so I thought I would coach Mariah's sport. And I had these like 10, 15 little girls, and I would try to coach them, have them go through drills, learn skills. I couldn't even get them to line up. I couldn't get them to listen, and so our games were just chaos, and it was just, it was, I mean, we played the way we practiced. It was just awful, and, and I, I didn't know what to do, and, and so there was this, this young woman in our community that played college basketball, and so I went up to her one day. I said, hey, would you mind coming tonight and helping me with Mariah's team, and she said, sure, sure, I'll come, and 
So she drove out, and it was a good ways away, and she showed up, and I was trying to get the girls together, and it was not working, and she watched, like, the first two or three minutes of chaos, and then she just pushed me aside. <laughs> and she commanded all those girls to line up, and they just ran and lined up. And then she started commanding them to dribble this way and go through this drill, and they did everything she said. And I thought, who replaced my girls? Because <laughs> that's the only explanation, right? I mean, the only explanation for how they're responding differently has to be them. Cannot be me. And that's the way most of us live our lives. We think that the world is in the chaos it's in because of the world that we're in, not because of the chaos within us. And the reality is that that, that one woman, when she stepped on that court, she knew she had authority. And because she knew she had authority, all those little girls knew she had authority. See, when I stepped on the court, I knew I did not have authority. I knew I was a poser. I was intimidated by those little girls. I was a victim. And I was powerless, and they knew it. <laughs> and that's the way most of us live our lives. Blaming our circumstances, blaming our environment, blaming God, blaming other people, because our life is a mess. And I don't know what you've been through, what has brought you to this moment, what kind of experiences you've been through, what kind of trauma you've experienced in your life, but I do know this, no matter where you've come from, no matter how broken you are, no matter how much pain you've had to carry, you are not without authority in your life. You have power to change your life. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I, there's a reason why I don't fully understand that. It's because it, it's beyond my comprehension. To understand the full totality of the impact of what we do in this life will have an eternity. But what I do understand is the basic principle here. Though you live within time and space, your actions, your life, your words, do not simply impact this moment. They impact eternity. I, I, I don't know why, but I, just, I could just see like the imagery of that. Like stepping into eternity and seeing something I've marked. I mean, a lot of people talk about making a mark in this life. Do you want to live and die without leaving your mark? Do you want to live and die without leaving your fingerprint on the story of human history? And that's, that's an incredible aspiration, but I'm telling you, it's too small. Because Jesus says that you have the capacity to bind and loosen in this life that will actually be bound and loosed in eternity. I don't want to just see my mark in time and space. I want to leave a mark in eternity that cannot be erased. <laughs> because what I want you to realize is not only have you been given authority, but this, this authority is to unlock the kingdom of heaven. And you will not understand how to do that if you do not understand that the kingdom is now. So the kingdom of heaven isn't something you unlock when you die. The kingdom of heaven is not to unlock the place you're going to go when you leave this earth. See, the kingdom of heaven is available to you in this moment, in this reality, in time and space. And Jesus is giving you the keys so that you can experience the kingdom now. And Jesus even says, the kingdom is within you. And... But for some reason, because we're, we're, we're logistical, linear creatures so oftentimes that we have to keep everything in sequence. Don't mess up my eternity. I need now and then I need then. I need time, then I need eternity. That's so limiting for God. Why would God create an experience of time and space that was disconnected from that which is most valuable? Eternity. He did not. Eternity exists in this moment right now. And the kingdom of heaven is waiting for you. Not out there, but in here. Which, by the way, is an important thing to note if you are going to know how to use keys. I, I have keys. And I, I lose keys, but I have keys. But, but one of the things that has been incredible for me, because I, I, I lose my car keys a lot, is that my car is designed where I have an app. And then I, I, when I can't find my keys, I just use my app. 
My app tells me where my car is. My, my app tells me, this is where you lost your mind. My, ad, <laughs> my app will then say, oh, would you like to lock or unlock your car? Pop, pop, pop. Then my app says, would you like to start me? Boom. And my app says, don't worry about losing your keys, because I got you. I got you. But here's the thing. My, my, my app also has other functions, like summon. <sighs> I want to use it so bad, but I've never used it because I'm afraid. But it's, I want to summon my car. I do, I just, wouldn't that be incredible? Like, come to me. Just have it driving down the street. It'd be amazing. And, and, and I've had this car for years. It's also self-driving, by the way, which I think I've used once. I used it coming down the 10 at the 4 or 5 intersection during rush hour, because I wanted to experiment. And I didn't know it actually could give me an option on gaps, spaces between cars. You can be one car away, two cars away, three away. That's pretty nice. But it was set on one. So I'm coming up, right up cars. I don't know if it's going to stop. And I'm trying to grab the steering wheel and the brakes. And, and I'm realizing the problem with self-driving is that I'm not driving. And, and so in all the years I had this car, I, Basically, I've never used self-driving. In fact, I look at all these functions. It has so many incredible functions. I've paid for so many functions that I have never used and will probably never use because it takes things out of my control. See, I think this is the reality of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God in your life. Is that you probably, you're basically the human version of a Tesla. You have so much capacity and you probably are satisfied using the 10% that keeps you in absolute control. Because the other 90% requires that you give up control and allow God to do a deeper work in you that takes things out of your hands. And, and I understand this whole dynamic of capacity. Sometimes we, we only think of physical capacity. We don't think of mental capacity. We don't think of emotional capacity. We don't think of spiritual capacity. Now, the longer I live my life, the more aware I am of physical capacity and limits. And so I tore my hamstring, recovered, then tore my calf, recovering. And, and I, I have to go to, well, I, I call it rehab, but Kim begs me not to call it rehab. Because she goes, she goes, it just sounds like you're always an alcoholic and, uh, or getting over some kind of drug addiction. And I said, well, you're, you're, it, when you're damaged this bad, it is rehab, honey. But, uh, so then I go therapy, but then it sounds like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm unstable. And, uh, but I am. I, they told me I, I actually have no balance. So, so I am unstable, <laughs> literally. And so I'm, I'm going through physical rehabilitation. And, and I was there a few days ago. And they pressed on my leg. And I needed a bar of soap. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I said very kindly, are you trying to kill me? And the therapist said, I am not trying to kill you. I am trying to increase your capacity. I didn't really need an object lesson right then. I didn't really need a new insight. But in that moment, it came crashing into my brain. If you want to increase your capacity, you have to be willing to take on more pain. And the reason most of us have never stepped into the fullness of the kingdom of heaven is we will not give up control and we will not allow God to take us through the pain necessary to become our best selves. But if you don't know it yet, you are not here without power. You've been given authority. And you don't have to wait until you step out of this life to be fully alive. The kingdom is now. The real question is, what will you do with the power you've been given? How do you actualize that power in this life? Oh, by the way, the, the scriptures tell us that the fullness of God, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus. And it also tells us that the fullness of Jesus dwells in you. So that tells me that I don't have just like a 1% capacity of God. See, I don't just have like a drop of God to help me make it through the day. God, the fullness of God dwells in Jesus, and the fullness of Jesus dwells in us. 
How much of God do you need? See, I think that the great difficulty is that God has handed us the keys. I, I, I don't know if that was the best strategy. See, because we keep saying, God, God, I, I'm in a cage. God, I, I'm limited. God, my capacity is so small. God, I, I have big dreams, but I, I don't seem to be able to actualize those dreams. God, God, I, there's so much I want to do in the world. God, God I, I just seem to be so limited. God, if you could just unlock the cage and set me free. And God goes, I have a better idea. I'm going to give you the keys. And if you'll use the keys, you're going to step into your freedom. You're going to step into your full capacity. You're going to step into being fully alive. You just need it. Use the keys. And we go, no, no, that's, I don't want the keys. I just want you, God, to come and unlock the door. And I was, no, no, I'm going to give you the keys, and you can unlock it whenever you want. No, God, I don't want that responsibility. I just want you to be God. Isn't that what we say? God, just be God in my life. And God's like, can you just be you in your life? <laughs> See, we want God to hold the keys and unlock all the doors that limit us so that it's always God's responsibility. But the truth is that if God unlocked the door without your will, you would not have the capacity to live in that level of freedom. Thank you. All the studies prove it. You raise a tiger or a lion in a cage. You feed it every day. You keep it safe. And it does not know how to survive the wild. You ever wonder why chickens don't fly? You ever wonder why I wonder that? You, you, know, you know how you can domesticate a hen? There's only two things necessary. You remove the predators and you remove the need to hunt for food. So if you protect them and feed them, they will lose their capacity to fly. Most of us, we want God to protect us and to feed us so that we can just become chickens, turkeys, and all we're good for is one good meal. We would rather God protect us and feed us than put us in the wild and teach us how to fly and how to hunt and how to live the great adventure of life. God is not going to unlock the door for you. He's going to hand you the keys and say, now your choice is whether you're going to live in the depth of the kingdom or you're going to stand on the outside looking in. But what are the keys? Because part of the problem is that we have keys, but we don't know how to use them. And I want you to realize that Jesus makes it so clear. Listen to this. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, I tell you again. Whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they, they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am in the midst. Why does Jesus add this? Because he's not trying to give you a source of magic where you speak things into existence. Because if you try to manifest the future without agreement with God's voice, you're just going to be a hollow echo spitting into the wind. But Jesus says, look, this is what you need to do. You need to get other people in your life. You need to get into a place where I am there in the midst because when you hear my voice and you're in agreement with me, when you speak it, you create it. It's the words that are the key. So let me just make this really practical just for a minute. See, some of you, every word spoken in your life has made your world smaller. You've been bound. Some of you feel you've been bound. Because you grew up and someone told you that you will never amount to anything, that you were worthless, that you didn't have any talent, there was nothing special about you, and you were bound. Some of you are walking with a straight jacket and you feel the suffocating limitation of all the words that were spoken into your life because they bound you up. And then Jesus speaks into your life and he tells you, you have value, that you have capacity, that you have potential, that you have greatness living within you and your soul draws toward it 
want so desperately to believe it, but you're bound. But our words can not only bind us, but they can loosen us as well. Man, if you're a parent, be careful what you say to your kids. Stop binding your children in fear, in doubt. Stop binding with a sense of insignificance. Let them know that they matter, they have identity and value. Speak into them where they are free to become who God created them to be. Some of you, you're desperate to be free, but the voices that you keep listening to are the ones that hold you captive. And you're like, Jesus, I just need you to come and unlock this cage. And Jesus, no, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to teach you how to fight for your freedom. I'm going to build in you the capacity to stand in that freedom. It is not incidental that the way God creates that caterpillar and transforms it into a butterfly is that it has to fight its way out of the cocoon. Because only in the struggle does it gain the capacity to fly. The struggle is the journey through which God makes you free. So Jesus in Matthew 8 has an encounter with a Roman centurion. When someone's called a centurion, it means they had a hundred soldiers under them. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. This Roman centurion understood that Jesus, the manifestation of God himself, God taking on flesh and blood, all he had to do was speak. And by his word, that servant would be healed because he was a man, a person of authority and under authority. See, I think a lot of times we want the power to speak life without letting the word that brings life speak to us. And the beginning point of grabbing the power of your words is by allowing God to speak into your life and shape who you are. If your parents or your teachers or your peers growing up could speak into your life and limit you, can you imagine what God speaking to your life could do? Can you imagine the creative potential inside of you if you would let God speak into your soul? Can you imagine how God would erase all the lines that limit you all the walls that are built by fear and doubt. Can you imagine what God would destroy within your soul if you would allow his words to speak into your life? Can you imagine how God would expand your imagination, your creativity, your vision, your future? I want to be that person that looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, you don't even show up. All you have to do is speak. Speak into me that I may be free. And then if you could understand that the same God who speaks life has given you the power of words to speak life. What would you do if you understood your words? Create and destroy. Your words, the words you choose, the words you speak, they will shape inside of someone else's soul the very nature of their universe. Oh, by the way, your words, your self-speak, I am so tired of hearing people every day say to me things like, oh, man, I'm just struggling. It's just a bad day. Any of you guys say that every day? I'm just so tired. I'm so exhausted. I'm so down. 
I mean, I'm down to help you when you're down. But it would just be really great if you would stop binding yourself with your words. And, and maybe it's time to start loosening on earth what will be loosened in heaven. Maybe it's time to wake up and speak to yourself and say, yo, universe within me, it's time to expand. It's time to take territory. It's time to grow. Are you listening to me? We will not be fueled by fear. We're going to be fueled by courage. Are you listening to me? I cast out all the despair and speak hope into my soul. Because here's, here's the secret. The reason you haven't figured out how to use the keys is that you keep trying to open a kingdom out here. And the keys Jesus gave you were for a kingdom in here. And in the same room, on the same planet, breathing the same air, standing on the same soil, are people in two different kingdoms. What kingdom will you choose? A kingdom of darkness or light? A kingdom of death or life? A kingdom of despair or hope? A kingdom that binds or a kingdom that loosens? What kingdom will you choose? By the way, the kingdom comes with a king and his name is Jesus. And when you place your life in his hands, he puts the keys in your hands. Would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment? I just absolutely know there are some of you who need the freedom that only Jesus can bring. And I want to speak freedom into your life. I want to speak a future into your life right now. I want to speak forgiveness and hope and laughter and love and life into your life. Will you receive it right now? Will you be in agreement with me about your life? Right now, just whisper it. Maybe say it out loud. I have a future and a hope. Right now, just declare it. I am alive. Say it. I am free. I have the keys of the kingdom in my hands. Now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here right now and you've never crossed the line of faith, you've never trusted Jesus with your life, I want to invite you to trust the God who loves you, who created you, who died for you, who rose from the dead, and is here right now and ready to give you life if you'll ask him. And if that's you, if you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, I just want you to whisper this declaration, Jesus, I give you my life right now. Just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Your words have power. Tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Your words have power to bind and loosen in time and eternity. Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, I want you just right now, just raise your hand up so I can see you and I want to pray for you. If you just whispered, Jesus, I gave you my life. Beautiful. Anyone else? Beautiful. Wonderful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. This is it. This is your moment right now. Just declare it. Jesus, I give you my life. Father, I pray that for each individual, the women and men in this room, who've just spoken the words, Jesus, I give you my life. I pray that right now, God, they would know that you have spoken and put your life in them. That from this moment to eternity, they belong to you. That in this moment, their choice is not simply written in human history, but it is written in eternity. And this moment will be marked forever and ever and ever.
I pray that you would envelop them in your love, wrap them up in your presence. That today would be a good day to be alive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just thank God for all those who just opened their lives to him? All right, guys. Here's your homework this week. Watch your mouth. Speak life. Get up in the morning and go, bam, this is a good day to be alive. I'm going to crush it today. I, I got crushed yesterday, but today I'm going to crush it. So when you, you want to say these things like, oh, I'm just tired or I'm exhausted, I'm depressed, I'm down, I'm having a hard time, it's okay to feel that. Just don't make that your declaration. Okay, just go, yeah, you know what? I'm stronger than this. There's more power in me than all the forces coming against me. This week, make your declarations. And if you want to know the difference between manifesting and materializing, just try to manifest without God. All right? But when you are in agreement with the God who speaks, watch out.